Great. Welcome. Welcome to this session on sustainable and resilient transport infrastructure and systems in Africa, very kindly hosted by the SLOCAT Partnership and in the International Transport Forum, ITF. My name is Shipran Aransuri, and I'm the chief of the Urban Practices Branch at UN Habitat, and it is my absolute pleasure to moderate uh, this session today. Can we move the slides, uh, please? Let, let's start with um, a few housekeeping um, announcements. So this session is structured with a, a keynote session, uh, with a keynote address and two panel discussions. Please use the Q&A function to ask any questions or leave any comments. We will do our best to, to address these in, uh, during the session and during the discussion with the panelists, but if we can't, we will duly note them and come back to you uh, if you leave us your, your contacts. And of course, um, please keep an eye out for session recordings, which will come out and the link will be available, I believe, on, on YouTube. Let's uh, quickly recap why we are here today and what is what are the objectives of the Race to Zero Dialogues uh, Transport Day. The Race to Zero Dialogues um, are, are being held um, in, obviously in the context of the, of the Paris Agreement and aiming for a zero carbon recovery also in this context of, of um, COVID. The, uh, the Transport Day has three main objectives to show that the transport sector can achieve the objectives of Race to Zero, which is a healthy, resilient and zero carbon recovery, that, um, that prevents future threats, creates decent jobs, and unlocks inclusive sustainable growth. Very importantly, looking at the, the path to zero emissions by 2050 at the latest. The second objective is really to share the progress that uh, non-party stakeholders are already making in specific subsectors of transport and using regional examples. And this particular session is of course focused on on Africa. Uh, and the third objective of this Transport Day is to show the pathway uh, to zero by 20, 2050 with a special focus on what actions do we need in the short term. In the next five years, how are we going to set ourselves up to, to, the, um, to achieving uh, the zero emissions by 2050? Um, as we know, as I said already, this session focuses on Africa, very important. African cities will add over 900 million new residents by 2050, which makes Africa the most rapidly urbanizing region on the planet. Yet the promise of opportunity remains out of reach for vast communities living in urban areas or in peri-urban areas with limited access to jobs, education, healthcare, and social opportunities. And that limited access is really an issue of sustainable transport, isn't it? Sustainable transport is the key, is, is a major key for achieving almost all SDGs. Under SDG target 11.2, we have promised that by 2030, everyone will have access to safe, affordable, accessible, and sustainable transport systems. But at this time, our database tells that 20 out of 1,260 cities, there is a global average of um, access to public transport at just over 50%. And in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, that figure is only 33%. So this is very, very important. Many cities across our continent have a very large percentage of walking and cycling as the mode share for all trips. That is, Ababa, Nairobi, where I am based, and your habitat is based, Dar es Salaam, Lagos, all have biking and walking modes at over 40%. So the majority of the population is really relying on these modes out of necessity because the, any other forms of motorized transport are unaffordable. Also, many African cities do not yet offer a clean, a modern and clean public transportation system. And we're, we're reliant on informal, uncoordinated paratransit services up to an extent of almost 80% in many um, African cities. And who does this impact? This does not impact the person who's going to use a car. This impacts 
disproportionately the vulnerable users, the poor workers living in the urban peripheries, you know, people who need to uh, commute for two hours to get to their place of work, they end up spending 30 to 40 percent of their incomes on bus tickets, just, just as an example. And then, of course, first, as Africa urbanizes and becomes more affluent, the absence of high rise, pub, high, uh, high quality public transport means that people start to buy more cars. And the cars they are buying are almost inevitably fossil fuel based. So we have some case studies today which talk about green, green vehicles. Um, and that leads us to the highest growth that Africa is demonstrating globally in carbon dioxide emissions between 2000 and 2017. For example, transport emissions during these years in Kenya increased by 230%. However, cost-effective and locally appropriate solutions are available in Africa and can bring enormous co-benefits. Co-benefits for the SDGs, co-benefits for more for reducing inequality, for reducing poverty, for access to jobs and livelihoods. Experience from across the world has demonstrated that we need a comprehensive approach. We need to reduce unnecessary transport demand. We need to shift to more efficient modes. We need to improve transport technologies uh, and we need to make transport systems more efficient, accessible, affordable, and ultimately sustainable. So this session brings together a really exciting group of actors that are working to transform African transport systems. They are focusing on infrastructure, they're focusing on e-mobility, they're focusing on uh, moving people and goods. And it is my absolute pleasure and honor to be moderating this session today. So let's open the session with uh, some, some remarks from Her Excellency, Madame Dagmawit Moges Bakele. Uh, the Minister of Transport um, for the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. Since, 20, since October 2018, you have been the Minister of Transport, and before this, you served also as the Deputy Mayor um, of, of uh, Addis Ababa City Government. Minister, Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. Uh, I would like to say uh, welcome to you all at this uh, great event discussing on sustainable and resilient transport infrastructure and system focusing in Africa. Uh, I would like to thank Mr. Yang Te Kim, Secretary General of International Transport Forum, and Ms. Maruksa Kardema, Secretary General for uh, Slow Cuts Partnership, and for inviting me to this uh, panel. Uh, as we all know that the development of sustainable and resilient transport infrastructure and systems has the capacity to create positive and environmental social impact. A relevant transport infrastructure is also a prerequisite for uh, bringing a more connected society that enjoys accessible and affordable and safe transport systems. My country, Ethiopia, as has doing its best to scale up sustainable and resilient transport infrastructure. And Ethiopia, as we all know, is among African large countries, uh, both in size and population number. And in fact, it is one of the largest landlocked population in the world. And in this uh, uh, context, our country, when we consider the landscape, the terrain is so much diversified. So the large size of the country accompanied by its diverse natural and social settings together with wider settlement patterns across the country has made the provision of infrastructure very challenging. But despite all this challenge during the past 20 years, we were able to uh, construct nearly 144,000 uh, always a roads and uh, about 900 kilometers of electrified railway line and about 200 kilometers of express road. And in our 10 year transport sector indicative plan, which is starting this year in 2020 and which is expected to last until 2030, 
we have forwarded plans to increase our all weather roads from 144,000 to 245,000 kilometers. And we have a plan to construct additional 4,000 kilometers of electrified railway line and also about 3,000 kilometers of express roads in 10 years' time. To bring sustainable and resilient transport infrastructure, we have envisioned and undergoing some activities that may include the following. The first one is a natural disaster such as flooding, landslide, and others are increasing in Ethiopia. We are encouraging sustainable and resilient transport infrastructure development as this provision may help the country to bounce back to normal condition after uh, facing different natural and man-made disasters. And the second one is infrastructure development without social environment consideration would cause negative impact on economic growth. So a sustainable and resilient transport infrastructure development should be done without bringing significant impact on social and environment settings. Hence, in our plan, we have stated the fact that the construction of transport infrastructure or service provision may take series of environmental audits before its implementation, even during the implementation phase. And the other one is sustainable and resilient transport infrastructure should also consider cost without compromising the quality. And a sustainable and resilient transport infrastructure should also uh, use resources wisely to conduct sustainable mode of transport. For instance, in Ethiopia, we have a plan to start inland water transport system. We have a plan to start a cable car transport system. And we have a plan to start a pipeline transport system. And all this is going to help us to shift the mode of transport from road transport to that of water and cable car and pipeline. And in this plan of ours, a significant step is going to be taken ahead so that we can save the environment in the uh, development of different modes of transportation. And the other one is uh, involving the private sector in the provision of quality infrastructure in a form of public-private partnership is one of the major significant policy shift that we have made during the past two years. And in doing so, we believe that the private sector is going to come and engage in a more uh, quality service provision while uh, they provide infrastructure that we requested them or what that they are engaging them, themselves in. And the other one is we have a plan to increase the capacity of regional governments. We have a federal form of government. Previously, it used to be only the federal government which is engaging itself in the construction of roads, especially asphalt roads. But now we design a strategy on how we're going to uh, classify the road types by differentiating those parts which is going to be done by regional governments and those parts to be done by the federal government. As regional government, regional governments are going to engage themselves in the construction, they will get a real-time data on how things are being done and they will be able to fix it in a way that is not going to cost us a lot in, in terms of environment and different kinds of uh, quality aspects. So uh, engaging regional government is one of the major intervention that we are carrying out in this current uh, situation. And the other one is uh, encouraging Ethiopian uh, uh, private sectors. Previously, it used to be only foreign investors, but also the private sector is uh, being given different kinds of incentives to be engaged aggressively in this area, even if there was uh, a start, we want to scale it up to the largest uh, level. And regarding the provision of sustainable and resilient transport service, we have also envisioned and undergoing some activities, including we have now the non-motorized transport strategy, which we ratified recently during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we expect the implementation of this non-motorized transport strategy in the coming 10 years in about 50 cities that we have uh, along uh, in different parts of our country.
And the other one is we have a plan to increase the uh, bus rapid lanes, the BRT lanes, not only in the capital, but also in different parts of uh, our country, especially urban centers. That is going to encourage the mass transport uh, system that we have rather than using individual vehicles. And the other one is our ministry, along with different international and local partners, we are also uh, um, exercising or implementing a monthly car free day, uh, uh, car free days, and different private sectors and non, non governmental organizations. They are helping us a lot to realize this. And these car free days, they empower citizens to use non motorized transport. Uh, rather than using motorized transport. So this monthly car free days is uh, being exercised in different parts of urban centers, but we want to scale it up to different, even to other uh, urban centers which did not start this uh, monthly car free days. And as a country, we should leapfrog for electric mobility. And we are building a massive hydroelectric dam, which we are going to enhance the wide use of uh, electric vehicles in our country and we aspire to be a model for other African countries in this front and uh, uh, my ministry is uh, is envisioning to promote green transport technologies in the country and accordingly we uh, gave due attention and we started uh, to mobilize different uh, electric car assemblers and manufacturers and we are giving them different kinds of incentives based on uh, the policy uh, options and based on the policy decisions that we uh, gave to them in a the form of tax incentives and others. So in the coming 10 years, we aspire to have nearly 1,500 electric buses which give service in urban centers. And we started to work on that as well. And the transport sector share of the emission is expected to raise from time to time. And to be able to curb that aspect, the ministry has identified and implemented various programs and projects, uh, including electrified Addis-Djibouti railway line construction and addis Ababa light railway uh, project and introduction of uh, inclusive kind of mechanisms for less uh, pollutant transportation technologies. And we are discouraging the import of, the import of secondhand uh, cars to our country by imposing nearly 700% uh, excise tax to discourage uh, the import of uh, secondhand cars. So this is the kind of measures that we are uh, taking in our country. And overall, we consider sustainable and resilient transport infrastructure service uh, system provision as an important contributor to our national economic growth and sustainable livelihood change and improvement of our uh, citizens' livelihood. And lastly, at this session, uh, it brings together as it's bringing different stakeholders in the government and private sectors. Uh, we uh, expect uh, to work with different stakeholders who are willing to work with us. We have started something, but uh, if we're not able to uh, engage different in the stakeholders, not only in our country, but uh, different partners worldwide, we know that we're not going to make it in the way that we want it. So I encourage you all to work with us and uh, make sure that the transport infrastructure is going to be resilient enough to serve uh, the public uh, that we uh, aspire to change their lives. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Minister. Really, thank you for illustrating exactly the type of integrated, comprehensive, multidimensional, multi-stakeholder approach towards sustainable and transport infrastructure that we all should be striving for. Uh, so this is this is really the the type of you know multidimensional policies that you mentioned. The working at different scales. Um, working with different uh, types of institutions, including your regional governments, engaging stakeholders. This is precisely the type of, I think, um, integrated solutions and approaches that we are, uh, that we are looking for and, uh, and we hope to learn from. So very much uh, an inspiration. Thank you, Minister.
and I hope you can stay on to to listen to some of the conversations around this uh, for as long as your your schedule permits. Thank you very much. Let's move now straight into the first panel, which is to understand the regional trends and trajectories more broadly in in Africa. What is happening around sustainably moving both people and goods? What is happening in terms of numbers, facts, and figures? But also, what are the policy trends? What are the investment trends? Where is where are we headed? Uh, you know, what can we learn from these trends? So. Um, we now have a panel which, will, uh, which has representation from organizations working to promote sustainable and resilient transport and mobility infrastructure in, in Africa. We, let me now introduce the panel. Um, first of all, we will have Ms. Ed Andriana Mbandi, Research Fellow at the Stockholm Environmental Institute, giving us a bit of an overview of the facts and figures related to transport infrastructure and mobility trends in, um, in Africa. Uh, then we have Ms. Winnie Mitula, Associate Research Professor at the Institute for Development Studies, Nairobi University, to provide an overview of policy trends in the region and to share some thoughts on what are the challenges and opportunities within existing policy frameworks, particularly for scaling up e-mobility, which is an, which is a special emphasis um, in this discussion. And finally, in this panel, we have Mr. Neji Larbi, the urban mobility specialist at the African Development Bank, the guys with the money. So Neji will talk a little bit about investment trends in the region, especially when it comes to transport and mobility infrastructure and also e-mobility, of course, uh, and share any, um, any insights from, uh, from the African Development Bank's work on the ground. So um, welcome to you all. And uh, let me start with you, Andriana. I know you have uh, some slides. Give us, give us a snapshot of what's happening in Africa. Um, thank you very much, Chiprash, uh, Chair. And I would like to also thank Slowcut International as well as uh, International Transport Forum. I've been tasked at looking at the resilient, healthy, zero carbon energy recovery in transportation in Africa with a special focus of looking at, you know, how can we encourage, uh, stimulate job creation as well as ensure sustainable growth in an inclusive way. Uh, as a quick introduction, I'm an engineer, I'm also an educator, and I'm also a budding entrepreneur. I'm mostly working on air pollution in African cities and looking at mobility. Now, looking at an overview of facts and figures on transport and infrastructure and mobility in Africa. Um, let's proceed, uh, please, to the next slide. So when I'm asked to look at infrastructure, uh, we in the research world in transport tend to think in terms of bricks and mortars. So we think, we think in terms of roads, bridges, um, that, well, that's what comes into mind when you think of infrastructure. But I wanted to tease out another way of looking at infrastructure in Africa by looking at energy, uh, both generation and consumption, looking at telecoms, um, and then looking at the transport infrastructure, transportation infrastructure in terms of unpaved roads or roads, uh, roads networks. Now, mm. in front of you, I'm hoping that you can actually see three figures. This comes from the International Energy Agency, Africa Energy Outlook Report of 2019. It is a very interesting report. It gives us uh, a lot of facts and figures for Africa in terms of energy, but it also gives us uh, case studies of different countries and how, how, what, what is the progress since the last report and how we can go forward. Now, um, the sub-Saharan trend is reflected in red. And if you look at the energy, now the reason I want to show you energy is because this drives our economies. We are here talking about sustainable transport and we cannot have sustainable transport without thinking about energy. Energy consumption and production is cap uh, captured in the Agenda 2063, the African Union Agenda 2063. Africa has a, one of the richest uh, renewable uh, resources. And yet, if you look at solar energy uh, resources, we only consume about, we only produce about 1%. Um, again, another example of our rich resources is the global gas resources. Africa is accounting for 40%. So if you look at that first chart for Sub-Saharan Africa in red for energy, there's no reason why our power generation has been static and not growing from, 20, uh, from 1990 to 2018. Now, another one I want you to look at is the telecoms. Think of cell phones, then think of mobile banking. Now, when you think of that, I hope that in your mind, you immediately th thought that Africa could indeed be a leader. 
This is because there's promising growth and uptake, uh, both in mobile banking and mobile uh, phone use. Um, but there's high penetration in our markets, and this should be captured, as you can see in that chart, there's a, a tremendous growth and perhaps potential. And then last but not least, looking at transportation, our unpaved roads. I want to put to you that more than half, half uh, of our roads in Africa are unpaved. In terms of transportation, we are still talking about inclusion and um, rural area transportation where there's not enough infrastructure to transport our goods, um, our services tra to travel to work safely um, in a clean way. So those three things might seem unconnected, but if you think of energy, it drives our transportation. If you think of a telecoms, it's an imagined way to connect uh, mobility in a sustainable way. And of, of course, we need infrastructure to leapfrog forward. Um, next slide, please. Now, this is a, 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 a road, in, it could be in any city in Africa. It's, I think, a little bit apparent to those who know uh, the number plates, they probably can't tell where this is. But I put it to you, this picture could come from Lagos, could come from Accra, it could come from Cape Town, it could come from, uh, it could come from Harare. Uh, this is a street. I took this uh, picture back in 2015. What I found interesting, of course, and there's many things to take away from this, is that these considerations of when you think about mobility, uh, when you look about, you think about tra sustainable transport, think about what comes to mind in terms of Africa and where we could go from here. We could go away from unsafe roads. When I look at that road, I'm seeing mixed road users. I'm seeing motorcycles in the same way with pedestrians in the same road with potholes, sewage. Um, and I'm seeing a road that is congested on one side, not congested on the other side, meaning that there's a poor transport uh, planning and even usage of the road. But I want to put to you as well, this means we have unsafe cars, unsafe roads, we have congestion, and we have pollution, which we hardly talk about in terms of emissions, impact on our health. This is being amplified even by COVID-19 as we deal with this, where there's inequality in terms of access to sustainable transport, but also exposure in, to emissions in terms of gender, in terms of eco socioeconomic status. So as we move forward, I want to tell you that there's multiple benefit pathways to consider in moving forward. There's growth, there's uptake of clean vehicle technologies to consider. We have youth and abundance of resources in Africa, and I think we can take it forward this way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Andriana, for that very, very interesting uh, perspective and bringing to us, you know, those different, those different dimensions. Indeed, we talk about transport infrastructure and we forget to talk about energy. That's that's a very interesting and a very important one. The minister mentioned it though in her in her speech around integrated policy making, and she talked about uh, you know um, electricity generation and the dam they're they're building. Uh, so, so for for hydropower, so very interesting and very important perspectives. Winnie, let me turn to you. Um, from a policy perspective, what are you seeing in in Africa? What is changing? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Shepra. I think uh, uh, I've been asked to reflect a bit on policy trends related to transport and mobility infrastructure with a focus on opportunities and challenges. And what I would like to note is that policies are not static. And I think this really is the issue. Uh, many times uh, across the, uh, the continent, we make policies and become very comfortable that policies are in place. But the issue is that with the current context where you have issues of uh, resilience and sustainability, uh, you need to go beyond just making a one-off policy and being comfortable with policy. And I'm glad we have the Minister for Ethiopia here who has highlighted some of those things, uh, various things that they are doing, and it would be interesting if she's still on to just tell us uh, how those issues have been embedded and the contentions and, and how they resolve them in terms of framing them into policy. Again, it's good to observe about the history of transport because if you look at history of transport across Africa, right from those trade routes that we had coming into colonialism with a disruption and uh, having a skewed approach to policy in that uh, policy was always skewed uh, you know, towards cash crops and all that. So even the context that we have in Africa for policy today is quite informed by that history. The, and even the post-colonial history uh, policy did not solve much because we then went into a lot of transport as infrastructure and engineering of roads. 
which again missed out all these critical points that are now on board. Of course, later on, we see issues of integrated economic growth and social inclu inclusion that we are trying to bring in. But first, we began by integrated transport policies. Those integrated transport policies were kind of not operationalized to the extent that they could embed most of these cross-cutting issues that we are now discussing. And it's very important. So if you look at where we find ourselves today, where we need to deal with growth, we need to deal with the inclusion, we need to deal with sustainability. These are all things that policy has to bring together on board. And with all that goes with policy in terms of policy negotiations, it becomes a very complex affair. Issues that we are now bringing into sustainability and transport, whether it's BRT, whether it's light rail, whether it's uh, elec electric vehicles, all these things are simulations that must be done. And of course, African cities and African states are at different stages of doing this. One other point I would like to remark is that a lot of it is uh, being supported by UN agencies, uh, being supported by Sub-Saharan Transport Policy Program, being supported by international uh, NGOs, including agencies like uh, that are listed for supporting this program, like Snowcat and uh, uh, ITDP and so many others. So that, again, that cushioning is good. But again, you can see that it's massive and the policies are not able to, to quite be comprehensive in terms of that. And I think this is a lot to do with, again, how you do your policy monitoring and move forward. So let me just mention challenges before Shipra stops me. <laughs> I think the challenges that we have in that context, the one, we have unreliable low volume transport systems. And of course, if you have unreliable low volume transport system embedded in paratransit largely, how do you then integrate in policy issues like the rail, the BRT, the electro, ele electric cars and all that? Yeah, th these are all technical things that sometimes when we present them and talk about them, maybe as scholars or, or advisors, they sound very easy. But in terms of policy, it's very complex how you, 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 you process them in a way that they make sense. The second one is the issue of funding. Uh, a challenge. How do you, the, 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 the resources that go into ensuring that you are able to monitor, evaluate, and learn and feed in, because I've begun by saying policy is not static, are very critical. That, uh, that, that, that kind of resource has to be there. And of course, plus human resource, which has, at times is a, a, a challenge depending on the context and the country you come from. Then the institutional and legal framework, which can also be very problematic. Uh, in our context. But I think monitoring, evaluation, and learning is the most critical. It's never well embedded in our policies, and yet it is what will fit in to change, to bring on board all these new parameters and measures that we are having. Of course, opportunities exist. Our political commitment is there. We've seen from the Minister of Ethiopia, and we appreciate what's going in Ethiopia and many other countries, even Tanzania. I think Nigeria is also trying some. Uh, we have quite a number that are trying some of these uh, uh, frameworks, including my own country, Kenya. But uh, that commitment is relevant. And now that it is there, it's an opportunity. NMT is being advanced across the continent, promoting you know, all these uh, modes that are good modes. E-mobility is beginning to be piloted, headed by UNEP and many other agencies. Those pilots are making sense, especially of two-wheeler and uh, one-wheeler systems. And of course, of late, we are also levering on, on COVID-19 and some of the, the learning and lessons that we can take home for policy in terms of planning and spatial dynamics uh, into that. Uh, just to conclude, I would then think that uh, policy needs to provide for sustainable connectivity and modes across spatial space. Sometimes we overemphasize urban. We need across spatial space. Two, we need continual monitoring, evaluation, and learning so that we are able to shift, change, improve, do what is needed for transport governance. And of course, uh, the next one is, again, I think government should lead transport mobility debates and interventions. And last but not last, there is need to leverage resources, including partners for sustainable development of infrastructure and appropriate modes of transport. 
Thank you. Thank you, Winnie. Very, very important points there. I think, um, you know, the fact that transport and sustainable uh, transport and mobility is an absolute driver of so many other things, of economic growth, of social inclusion, of urban rural connectivity, of balanced regional development, of our climate mitigation means that we need, we need dynamic policies, as you said, we need responsive policies, and we need the implementation and the monitoring of those policies. I will ask you one further question, but maybe I will leave it with you now to think about it while we move to, to Neji. You know, you talked about paratransit and you talked about this political commitment, et cetera, at this point to innovate. I want you to think about the answer to a question which has been bothering me for a while. Isn't the shift out of paratransit also a political issue? and a political hot potato in many countries. And how do we deal with that? So I will leave you to think about it and I will move on to Neji. Um, Neji, if you can give us some sense from what are the banks thinking? What are you yes. seeing on that? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Shipra. Uh, the bank, as you know, the African Development Bank is the bank of the African people and the African countries. And uh, the transport sector is, is the major part of the investment of the bank in the regional uh, countries, member countries. And I think uh, the problem right now is to, uh, is to come to uh, this uh, clean transport mobility and uh, uh, the real problem is in urban areas, etc. And the bank now is uh, thinking a lot about uh, how to uh, to come to these issues in uh, our countries. I think uh, most of the investment done till now in uh, our countries in Africa are about uh, roads, roads connecting uh, cities in a country and uh, connecting countries, uh, the corridors for the, uh, improving uh, commercial uh, activities, etc. Uh, right now, we have uh, an urban uh, development and the urban mobility division who will take uh, care about all these problems and issues uh, in our uh, urban cities. Uh, and we know now, uh, in most of our countries, the, the problem of the transport in our urban areas are very, very uh, uh, polluting and uh, very, the fleet is very, very old and uh, people are very poor to get uh, to modernize their fleets, et cetera. So uh, I think the first point is to, to come with the governments of each country and uh, especially the cities to think about the transportation planning first and how to manage this in, uh, in a way, a modern way and how to introduce the new technologies of this management uh, the technologies on the uh, uh, vehicles, uh, electric, electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles, etc. And it's uh, we have a lot of work right now, but uh, with the COVID this year, we have uh, stopped to uh, visit countries and cities and to discuss directly with people in uh, our countries. I think uh, next year, I think, uh, and I hope with this uh, COVID, uh, pandemic uh, finish, we will uh, start moving to the new technologies and uh, inviting people to think about the new uh, uh, way of thinking in planning, in uh, uh, transportation management in our cities and uh, how to come to the clean energy in, uh, in our cities. Uh, this is uh, this needs a lot of investment, and I think uh, the countries need a lot of help, in uh, especially in investment, to come uh, and to introduce these new technologies. The the maximum, the majority of uh, public transport in our city as uh, para transit or what we call the informal sector, and this sector is uh, is alone. He has nothing, and uh, no one is helping him to to come to uh, modernize the, the vehicles or to uh, introduce the new technologies and uh, how to come to, to make cooperation or uh, uh, to introduce new technologies in this sector. Uh, to buy a car uh, in uh, 
new car in our countries, it's very expensive for this kind of operators. And they need to uh, find uh, uh, funds, funds from countries and from uh, the, 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 the other uh, uh, banks, uh, etc. So how to come to uh, make this strategy working with all countries and to make this uh, public transportation uh, operators, which, which are very, very important for our, our countries in uh, in Abidjan, where am I? They say, uh, maybe 80% uh, mm -hmm. of, of public transportation are uh, in formal sector. So uh, if we kill this uh, 80%, no, no one will move. No one will, 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 uh, will travel to uh, his work, to his house, to his school, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, how to come to this? Uh, I think this is the, the challenge uh, for the African Development Bank in the few uh, future years. And uh, we are working to uh, come uh, over this problem to, uh, with the cities, with the governments, and with the Ministry of Transportation to introduce new ways of funding these uh, people, how to uh, make uh, proce processes and procedures to, to get uh, access to these new technologies and the, the new vehicles, new cars, and new uh, mm -hmm. etc. This is uh, our thinking uh, in the futures. And I think it's uh, good for all our countries. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, very, very, very interesting. Also linking to my previous question, what do we do with the paratransit and with the informal sort of public transport uh, modes that are predominant in, in uh, most African, African cities? And you raised a very important point that, you know, who's looking after those? Who's thinking about modernization of those? You can't yes. just shunt them. And as I said, it's a political issue as well. So very important. Uh, and I will leave you with one question to think about in terms of your future urban mobility division and your future investments. To what extent will e-mobility be a focus of those, of those investments that you're going to support? So uh, maybe you want to take it right now uh, or think about it while I pick up question from the chat. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, I will I will pick up another question from the chat to all three panelists. Uh, we have, as I said, we've floated one question around paratransit, one around investments in e-mobility and where that is going. And there is a question from the chat which says, where does resilience fit in here? Transport infrastructure is not just about uh, getting to net zero, it will also have to be resilient in a mm -hmm. two to three degree warmer world. Uh, as well, how do we ensure that transport systems are planned in such a way that a they are resilient in and of themselves, and b they increase resilience of the communities they serve? It's a very important question. Uh, if anyone would like to, Winnie, um, Andriana, Nancy, yeah. would you like to touch upon any of these questions? Yeah, particularly the uh, last one. Yeah, let me just uh, touch upon this issue of uh, paratransit. I think I like to see these modes in Africa in a, a hybrid uh, lens. I think it's more, uh, even if we have to shift, uh, there will be a phase where we just need to take the hybrid approach. And uh, this is not very different from informal sector, which uh, some years back Africa thought would do away with and never went away. So the paratransit should be seen in the same context and is more of how do we improve them? For example, if we are now improving fuel emissions and standards, whatever, how do you improve the ones that are still in space? It would be very interesting to hear how Ethiopia is dealing with those many of those their taxis that I've always boarded when I'm there, and they're really. So, is it discarding them? Is it renewing them? What do you do with them? And I foresee a phase of transition. And this transition has to be luring and has to be kind of, there has to be an incentive why one moves from one to the other, because there is a logic uh, within which the paratransits operate, and that's mm -hmm. why they are winning. And even if you take the motorcycle cycles that are now in, in place, they are not any better in terms of operations, but they are fulfilling a demand. They are fulfilling a demand, a need, but their operations, their level of safety is just horrible. But uh, they are there, almost replacing maybe the, the, the other known paratransits that we knew. 
So I think it's, it's more of see, using a hybrid lens and seeing how to manage the hybridity as we move to an ultimate, which we don't know. Thank you. Thanks, Winnie. Thank you very much. Um, Andriana, any thoughts on, on these questions around resilience? Thank you very much. I think um, the way I look at this is that uh, what we tend to do in a, in, in a lot of the infrastructure, given the capital expenditure on them, is to go business as usual. But as a researcher, I put it forward to you that there is a way to do to answer some of these questions two to three degrees in terms of scenario planning. Can this scenario uh, scenario building be used in, in in terms of planning for infrastructure, in terms of maintenance, in terms of uh, looking for the full cycle of infrastructure? But then as well, include all communities and all uh, different disciplines in the planning and the maintenance of infrastructure. That means co-production co of the planning, uh, you know, instead of people working in silos, working better, integrating all these different communities and knowledge so that we have an answer as to what happens, or at least as it is happening now, how can we mitigate it? Thank you, Shipra. Thanks, Andriana. Neji, you have some thoughts on on how we're going to finance this resilient infrastructure from uh, you know, uh, what the questions that have been raised and also a little bit on e-mobility, if that's a focus for the bank? Yes, uh, from the experience, we have a lot of problems with the governments that, pe that people, the paratransit uh, operators, they don't have any, uh, uh, let's say, uh, they, they, they have to buy the car in the, the, the price in the market, so uh, nothing, from the government gives them the opportunity to uh, to be uh, uh, to get this car at the lower play, uh, price and all the ta they pay all the taxes uh, in each government. So uh, I think case by case we need to to talk to the governments and uh, let them uh, be implied in the, the the financial part. That means if they reduce the taxes for this type of uh, vehicles and uh, give uh, uh, loans for these operators at uh, low rates, etc. Uh, we can uh, improve this uh, the quality and uh, the access to the electric uh, vehicles or uh, hybrid vehicles, etc. So we are looking to that, but it's a question of uh, discussing with the governments and uh, to, to, to mm -hmm. get how they can how, how much they can give to these uh, operators. This is the, the, the way to, uh, to introduce this uh, good quality and new technologies, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. And just to say, I think, that, I think it comes down to, as you said, it comes down to really identifying feasible business models. Uh, and that requires a conversation with all actors, particularly government, as well as, these, as well as the operators. You know, UN Habitat has a project called Solutions Plus, uh, funded by the EU, where we are assisting um, the city of Kigali and other cities to actually do exactly this, to identify feasible business models and, 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 and implement e-moto taxis and e-bikes for this last mile connectivity and, and making these transitions. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of thoughts to this. There are many other questions in the, in the chat in the Q&A, please keep them coming and I will take them up in the next panel as we go along because we really must move. Thank you so much to all of you. And we will now move to the next panel. Allow me to introduce um, the panelists for the second session. Uh, we have Ms. Charlene Kouassi um, uh, re representing the Ivory Coast Roadmap. Um, then we have Ms. Amien van der Merf, uh, founder and managing director of the Green Cab from South Africa. We have Ms. Dora Mwenye, coordinator for Mobility for Africa in Zimbabwe. Mr. Henry Kamau, executive director, Sustainable Transport Africa. And finally, Ms. Claire Birungi, country manager, ITDP Institute for Transportation Development Policy, Uganda. Colleagues, and um, thank you for joining us. I want us to build on the discussion you've already heard and um, share with us your insights from some projects that you've been implementing on the ground that are already serving in some ways to transform uh, the transport and mobility uh, sector in, in our continent. And we're very pleased to have representation from different parts of the continent and so that you can learn from each other and the participants can learn 
uh, from you and we can learn from you. So without further ado, may I invite Charlene? Charlene, can you switch on your camera, please? Uh, to talk a little bit about uh, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, what, what is happening in, in the Ivory Coast um, in terms of transformation of the transport systems, please. Thank you very much, Shipra. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm Charlene Kwasi, representing the African Mobilities Observatory in Cote d'Ivoire. And I would like to thank SLOCAD, uh, the International Transport Forum, and Climate Chance also for the opportunity given uh, today to present how things are moving forward here. Um, I would be I would be sure as we have three minutes, but uh, I would say that even though uh, the Côte d'Ivoire's transport system is far from being uh, efficient, inclusive and sustainable at the moment, uh, since a couple of years, uh, Côte d'Ivoire authorities are strongly uh, involved in improving um, the transport sector through notably the creation of a mass transport system to improve multimodality, intermodality, um, but also on decarbonation of transport with important laws and projects uh, going on towards uh, banning the import of old vehicles, for example, uh, but also the renewal of both conventional and informal uh, transport fleet. And uh, lastly, the electrification of public transport. So the plan at the end is to uh, electrify 30% of the car fleet of the country by 2050. Uh, I don't know if you heard about it, but the light rail um, and the bus rapid transit project, uh, and as well as the reinforcement of the existing water transport lines are one of these examples. So a lot of things are going on and we hope that it will be implemented and monitored well. Um, concerning the sustainable mobility roadmap, we are really honored and proud to, to have uh, led this, this project with, uh, with Climate Chance and PPMC, which is uh, the Paris process on uh, mobility and climate with the Ivorian Ministry of Transport supported by uh, Michelin Foundation. And we have started to work on this roadmap to really guide the, deci the decision makers, sorry, in making policies towards sustainable mobility uh, in the country. It is an interesting project that has followed the Moroccan uh, mobility roadmap in Africa, which is the, the, first, uh, the first mobility roadmap. And Cote d'Ivoire is expected to be the second country to have such an important uh, document so uh, to help building strong policies for better and, and greener transport, um, both on national and local level. That, that what is, uh, that's what is a, a major change. Uh, I think that it will also inspire other countries to do the same. I, uh, I know that Kenya uh, has also engaged the same process and uh, it is very important uh, for us and essential to, to have local perspectives to address transport sector and climate change uh, issues, taking into account the constraints of uh, transport ecosystem. Oh, it's to improve uh, the condition of uh, mobility uh, for people, but also for goods. So that's why this process has been so important and elaborating with non-state actors, such as NGOs, companies, startups, and experts, alongside with the, with the government to, to share a common vision of mobility by 2015 Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, I don't know if I have much time to, to get uh, more. No, I don't have much time. So if you have any question on the process or the next steps, I will be happy to, uh, to answer it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Shailene. We'll come back to you a little bit, maybe on the challenges that you face. Okay. So think about it for a second as we move through the through the panel. But I would like you to perhaps highlight uh, highlight the challenges in the challenges. Sector. Okay. No problem. Uh, an integrated roadmap, a multi-dimensional, multi-stakeholder roadmap. Uh, let me, in the meantime, move to. Uh, to Amien van der Mer, uh, the, uh, from Green Cabs South Africa. Amien, tell us what Green Cabs 
South Africa does and how it is uh, combining many objectives, the green objective, the transportation, of, the mobility objective, and uh, the empowerment and social inclusion objective. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you kindly, Shipra. Um, just a, 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 a kind of a um, qualifier right from the, um, the, the word go is that it is um, entirely a private sector perspective, not a government perspective or, yeah. Good, we so, want it. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So our, our journey or our race to zero pretty much started um, a decade ago. And if I say I was myself and four other women who started the green cab and starting a transport company in the middle of an ecological recession, we very much knew it couldn't be business as usual. If you can put on the first slide, please. Next one, I mean, yes. So we knew we had to go the extra mile to take responsibility for our footprint and to ideally reverse that slide into ecological debt. So as you'll see on the slide, we were very pioneering and deployed various devices and technologies and alternative fuels such as biodiesel, used cooking oil, uh, liquefied petroleum gas, um, as well as various devices, tailpipe devices, a blade we imported from Brazil, um, fuel additives, product called Envirox, um, as well as a secondary diesel particulate filter. So that is saying, so if we don't have clean vehicles yet, what, are, what can we do in terms of technology to at least reduce our footprint? And what we subsequently did over the past 10 years, primarily operating in the event sector and business travel, is for instance, with an event, um, we've serviced the last consecutively, the last four World Economic Forum on Africa event. We use non-green vehicles. We don't even have a Euro spec six vehicles in South Africa. Um, and we log the kilometers very diligently um, and then compensate in full and, and um, issue a green transport certificate. Next slide, please. So as you can see, we are fortunately um, getting a, a, a quite congested um, eco-mobility um, 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 landscape in South Africa, which is encouraging. It's pretty much uh, development over the past um, uh, five or so years in South Africa. We have electric vehicle industry association. We have fantastic institutions like um, Uyulo, that is a multi-stakeholder um, initiative that facilitate and mobilize electric uh, mobility in South Africa. We have various events um, such as the Congress coming up next year. We've just had the second Smarter Mobility Africa online summit. Um, uh, the first last year, sadly, we couldn't have the second annual one this year, um, electric vehicle road trip that was great at um, raising awareness. And then in terms of the ecosystem and very importantly for people who want to operate cabs on um, with electric mobility, obviously is your charging infrastructure. And they're the likes of grid cars um, and EV crowd route, et cetera, in South Africa is playing all private initiatives um, plugged into the corporate opportunities offered um, by the OEM. So you will see the BMW i3 there. We also have um, Jaguar and um, Mini, as well as um, uh, soon to be, hopefully, the Mercedes um, EQ and Audi e-tron in South Africa and quite a, a little um, basket of, of plug-in hybrids. Um, so increasingly, we've got a more um, um, facilitating um, ecosystem developing in. Uh, last but not least, ap apologies, the Department of Transport has um, um, two years ago launched what is called uh, 2050 um, Green Transport Strategy. Uh, we, we fear as greenies that it's um, slightly lacking in ambition, but they do mention EVs as um, one of the strategic initiatives, but as one of the previous speakers says, um, particularly from, from the Development Bank, sadly no incentives to date and, and um, big hurdles in that regard. So we've got some distance to travel. Last slide, thank you. Next slide, thank you. Great. So we believe that the opportunity that arise from the climate crisis, um, rise in electric mobility, and sadly in South Africa, the, the twin pandemic of gender-based violence is that we can use this opportunity um, as a vehicle to drive women's participation um, in the green economy. And just a quick snapshot, um, in South Africa, for instance, in the e-hailing sector and traditional metered cab sectors, 
um, combined, our participation sit at less than 2%, 1.8%. So we still have a very far distance to go, as you can imagine. And we also believe that it can provide a vehicle um, and, and economic mobility for women to not remain in um, abusive um, situations. Mm -hmm. um, so in order to achieve this, we are in the process of establishing a women's driving economy academy, ap 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 apologies. Um, because it, we would need to, to address systemically why women is so absent in the sector, and one of the major factors, obviously, is the, the is the is financial barrier. So, if we teach women to drive for free and then plug them into sustainable um, livelihood opportunities, servicing corporate contracts, um, we believe that that is a way to go, and it'll be one of the so-called co-benefits that um, uh, the minister. Um, referred to and we will make inroads into a traditionally very male dominated sector. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really, I mean, talking about using, uh, you know, um, one entry point, but then, you know, developing multiple uh, co benefits and multiple opportunities out of that one entry point. Thank you very much. This is why we need the private sector on board for the innovation for the out of the box thinking. And uh, and for the persistence, I think that's very important. Thank you so much, uh, Anil. Um, again, I think I think there are there are some questions coming into the chat, and I will take them up in in a second. But let me move on to Zimbabwe. Dora, tell us a little bit about what you do with mobility for Africa, and um, what are you doing in the e-mobility space around bicycles, around uh, two wheelers, three wheelers, etc. Okay, how are you everyone? Thank you for having me. Um, I would like to congratulate the previous speakers for highlighting especially the challenges that we have in Africa. They are similar. But for this presentation, I'll put into context some of the concerns that could not have been raised, especially looking at the gender issues and also how these challenges are appreciated by women themselves. Uh, and also, for we are departing from the norm of urban mobility, going into rural mobility. As one of the speakers said, we should look at mobility, not only concentrating in the uh, urban areas. Next slide, please. Okay, the constraints have already, have already been highlighted, but of major concern is that in this project of ours, we engaged the uh, women themselves to come up with constraints and they violated these constraints in the um, rich picture that you see indicating the distances which they travel in terms of uh, um, acquiring services. And also of interest is in that we, on reviewing literature, we find that not much has been researched upon in terms of gender and transport in Zimbabwe. Yet women, they contribute a lot as they also travel a lot. And as Zimbabwe, we aim to reduce greenhouse gases emission by 33% per capita. So there's really need to consider women who are the major uses of uh, transport and who travel more using the, the road. Next slide. Yeah, as mobility for Africa, who, after realizing those challenges, we came up with a solution to give rural women a new way to travel using solar-powered uh, electronic vehicles. And the processes that we did were engaging the communities themselves through consultations throughout the project. And we also managed to establish a solar-powered a solar station in the rural communities which provides batteries where women can exchange for a fee. Somebody was talking about, asking about profitability and um, ability to pay for services. And we also train the women and provide technical backup uh, for the um, three-wheeler. We are using a three-wheeler, which we call Hamba. And also we have got a robust monitoring and evaluation system. Somebody said for transport we need that and uh, which uses both quantitative and qualitative aspects. As you can see from the slide number five, where we've got a tracking system. 
Our aim of doing all this is to come up with a business model so that uh, the women will find um, um, businesses and uh, which are um, anchored on the tricycle. Right now, we have got a model indicated. We are now at the stage of testing and providing uh, business concepts. Next slide. Next slide, please. I will now just highlight some of the outputs that we have um, uh, managed to have as a result of introducing the three-wheeler in the community. We have got three business enterprises, one that is providing transport service and uh, the other one which engages women in buying and selling within the community and the other one which is in agriculture. These enterprises have improved women's livelihoods. Currently, we have got about 55 tricycles in the community. And also we have got, uh, and these are benefiting plus or minus 2,000 households directly uh -huh. and indirectly. And um, also we provide in transport for school children and also uh, improvements in health services and also reduction in treasury. For example, fetching firewood, fetching water mm -hmm. using the tricycle, and also diversity in a number of ways. Our main thrust is to go to commercialize, to scale up and to commercialize, mm -hmm. and also to be able to measure the, to estimate the greenhouse gas uh, reductions that we are contributing to the country by using the tricycles. And of interest mm -hmm. is this pilot project will be cited in the CTCN partnership uh, project with Zimbabwe for e-mobility policy formulation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dora. Very interesting also for taking forward the women's empowerment perspective from, from Amien's uh, presentation and drawing our attention to the very important challenges of rural mobility. Um, so thank you very much for that. Let's move on to Henry Kamau, who's the Executive Director of Sustainable Transport Africa. Henry, what are you seeing in terms of the scaling up of electric vehicle infrastructure um, in Nairobi and other cities in the region? The floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, um, uh, Henry Kamau, Sustainable Transport Africa. I'll just give a brief update on what we've been doing and then I can go on to the scaling up uh, initiatives being undertaken. So initially we started with eliminating lead in petrol and gasoline, uh, which was done successfully throughout the continent, uh, perhaps with one country. Uh, then reducing sulfur in diesel, uh, this helped uh, improve on, on, on uh, uh, air pollution. Uh, then the next stage was uh, reducing vehicle tail tailpipe emissions. Uh, which involved introducing vehicle standards, uh, inspection and maintenance uh, uh, regimes. And we did a project with the World Bank on rationalizing the vehicle fleet in Africa, as well as introducing programs for introducing inspection and vehicle maintenance uh, garages and so on. Uh, we also did work on bus rapid transit uh, and presented at COP21 uh, proposal for electric buses for BRT projects that were to be introduced in uh, Nairobi and other cities. Uh, and uh, on e-mobility, this is what we're working on currently. We're working to introduce uh, two and three wheeler electric uh, uh, vehicles uh, uh, targeting the border border sector, which is a motorcycle taxi sector in, uh, in Kenya and other countries within the region. So we're targeting five countries uh, in Africa on this. Um, this is a big project we're working on with the UN environment. Uh, we also have a project with the GIZ on uh, e-cargo bikes as well, uh, introducing e-cargo bikes. Perhaps you've seen what we call in Kenya Mokoko tennis. These are hand carts that are pushed to carry uh, and, and they're very st stressful on uh, the, the operators. So e-cargo bikes will help uh, improve the efficiency of, of uh, distribution of goods on these uh, projects, yeah. And then uh, on work that's being done to scale up, uh, work that's been done to scale up, um, Oops, is it only me or have we lost Henry? We no, lost we him. Lost. We, are we are losing him. Uh, so we only use about yeah. uh, 
75 percent of a second Henry. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, am I on there now? Hello. Yes. Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, you can hear me now, right? Yeah. Uh, and the video isn't there. Okay, I don't know what's happened. Okay. Wow. Okay. Okay. We Should I just continue? We can, we can hear you and see you. Please go ahead. Oh, you can see me as well. Okay, let me continue. Okay, yeah. So, uh, so Kenya generates uh, excess renewable energy. Uh, so the country only uses about 75% uh, of what is generated. So there's a lot of uh, work being done by Kenya Power. Kenya, they're trying to look for how the uh, additional power that's generated can be absorbed. So Kenya Power, KenGen, and CAPS are all working out to roll out a vehicle charging infrastructure in the country to try and uh, scale up the adoption of uh, e-mobility in the country. Uh, uh, African governments are also increasingly supportive of uh, electric mobility as they realize that fuel imports comprise the highest single commodity import item for many African countries. And this bill can be reduced by scaling up e-mobility. So for example, Kenya reduced excise duty on vehicles powered by electricity only to 10% from 25%. So governments are realizing the benefits of this. Um, uh, uh, on e-mobility, both public and uh, private transport has the highest impact on reducing urban air pollution. And this would also improve public, uh, this would also improve air quality as well as public health. Uh, funding is also a key issue in the rollout of infrastructure. However, there are a few funding opportunities mm -hmm. starting to open up for the rollout of uh, EV infrastructure on the continent. Yeah. And uh, just to note, uh, hybrids and plug-in electric vehicles have formed a substantial portion of used vehicle imports. Uh, I think over the whole continent, there's a, quite a number of hybrid vehicles that are coming in. And there's also full battery electric vehicles being imported, imported as used vehicles, uh, mainly Nissan Leafs. And there's a couple of Teslas also finding their way to the region. So the continent is getting aware of uh, the benefits of electric mobility. And the uptake is starting to build up uh, slowly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's Very it. good. Thank right. you so right. much. Uh, thank you for that uh, for that perspective. And there are right. colleagues. There are a number of questions coming into the Q and A while you're listening to your colleagues. If you want to go into the Q&A, there are particular questions that have been asked of particular presenters, including some people asking for your contact details for, for further uh, conversations. So please do go into the Q&A and you can type your answer there. Uh, or if there's a particular question that you want to pick up in the final uh, Q&A uh, discussion, I'd be happy to give you the floor. Let me move now to my last speaker, Claire. Um, uh, from, from ITDP in, in Uganda, Claire, uh, last but certainly not the least. Building on what Henry said, you know, tell us a little bit more about the potential for the uptake of electric mobility in Africa, particularly in the paratransit um, uh, sector as, as well. Um, and, uh, and how does this link up with the larger question of integrated design, urban planning and design solutions? Um, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Shifra. I hope everyone can see my uh, screen. We can um, see your slides and we can see you. Okay, so I'll just go straight onto it. Uh, I think I uh, just wanted to paint uh, a general picture of uh, the mobility. I was giving a case study in Uganda. Um, of course, uh, like many speakers have already mentioned, uh, most of our transport uh, in Kampala cities, mostly are pedestrians. Uh, border borders and many bus taxis, most of which the border borders and the mini bus taxis take a bigger percentage and are currently uh, polluting modes. As you can see, uh, they are the mini bus taxis and uh, the border borders. So these are the key areas I think that, uh, that need to be made to clean uh, through electrification. And there's some practical works uh, that uh, we are doing uh, in Uganda, some groundwork, um, the government of Uganda is now working on how we can engage the paratransit sector uh, to basically move uh, from the low from the low occupancies to high capacity uh, clean vehicles. And there's also some uh, good initiatives uh, in in the motorbike sector. So the motorbike sector is very uh, important in Uganda right now. And mm -hmm. like during COVID, once they increased uh, the the vehicles are moving at half capacity. So the public transport uh, fares are really high. So majority of the people have now moved uh, to the motorbikes whose prices uh, did not change. So we are seeing uh, some works on uh, the motorbikes uh, being um, electrified. 
and then also we are there is some works being done by it's a local company called uh, Chira Motors where they have designed uh, some electric purely electric buses uh, they're also on the move to to design uh, solar EV charging stations. They have already put up uh, some of their buses on the bottom uh, right is one of their buses that, that is completely electric and has, has been moving, I think, for about uh, three months, more than three months or a year right now, and they're looking to scale up uh, on this initiative. So these are some of the good groundwork initiatives uh, that we have in Uganda, sorry. And then on the bottom right is uh, the, the role of, we have the electric uh, vehicles, uh, but we also need to create the spaces for them to be able to move, move more people into public transport and reduce uh, the need for the private car uh, usage. But it's also important that uh, the last mile connectivity and the urban spaces also provide uh, safe spaces for people to be able to walk and cycle. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Claire. Very, very uh, good to see the different kinds of uh, initiatives and, and uh, innovations uh, being piloted. And I think that's very important. We, are, we have only about a few minutes. So I want to flag two or three questions from, uh, from the Q&A and maybe give you a minute or so to respond. Whoever would like to take it up, not necessarily everyone taking up everything. I think there is, uh, there is an important question around used cars, uh, which a number of you flagged as a, you know, a policy change that is happening in many countries. You're banning the import of used cars. But, but Hiten Parmar is saying the used car market in Africa exists because of affordability access. You know, the, the outright ban of used vehicles in Africa doesn't resolve that problem, but rather, can we not create a more favorable environment for used electric vehicles to come into the market? Henry, you touched upon some of the tax uh, tax breaks and, and issues. So perhaps this one is for you. Just hold for a second. I want to flag that. Um, and also linked to that is a question around electric vehicles remain quite expensive, um, you know, because of and, and they and because of the way they're built and the uh, the specialized expensive rare earth metals they use, there are embedded carbon emissions. You know, so um, is it really a good option? That's a that's a bit of a, you know, a challenge uh, to us. Uh, is that really the way to go? Um, then I think there is one other question which Winnie said you might want to answer live, which is could public private partnerships be the solution for found for construction of big infrastructure? So Winnie, if you'd if you'd like to um, take that question, that would be good. Charlene, I already wanted to hear from you a little bit on challenges. Um, that that you you um, you you faced in your uh, roadmap development. Um, then there is another question on hybrid and electrical vehicles. The challenges of deficit of local skills, you know, to maintain them, and the high cost of replacement batteries, etc. What are the actions? You know, it is an integrated solution space, really. If you want to encourage electric vehicles, how are those being encouraged? So uh, let me give the floor to whoever wants to go first. No more than 30 to 45 seconds for your answer, please. Uh, why don't I start with Why don't I start with Winnie, who's already there Thank online? You. <laughs> and, Thank you. Uh, and then we go to Henry, uh, to Dora, and to the others. Whoever wants to come in, Winnie, you go first. Yeah, One I, minute I, back. Yes, I just want to acknowledge that uh, public-private partnerships are good but they are very complex. They need skills and political commitment. So I think that's really where the issue is. Many times we get into the public-private partnerships, but these partnerships are being led by private investors without uh, public entities putting a front feet into the entire process. So along the way, things collapse. So I really think that getting the right skills, the right commitment, and uh, working with experts like uh, people like Henry that I'm seeing on board so that when you work with experts, you are able to get it right. Otherwise, you can't move. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. That's absolutely important. The capacities for public-private partnerships are not always there, and the arrangements may not always be beneficial to all. So I think it's very important to think about it. Henry, I want to come to you on this whole question of electric vehicles, um, used cars, 
um, the the uh, possibly the tax incentives for import of used electric vehicles, right. Right. and possibly also looking at these questions around maintenance and viability of electrical vehicles in in Africa, and then right. I perhaps also go to uh, to go to uh, Claire on the same question, and then I'll come to Dora and Adriana. Uh, yes, yes, uh, definitely. Used vehicles uh, form around 80% of the imports uh, in Africa. Uh, I think it's only South Africa and Egypt uh, where there's a total ban on uh, the import of used vehicles. Uh, so that's something we can't get away from. Uh, increasingly, I think what happened, uh, hybrid vehicles started being imported into the country. And increasingly, it was, it was discovered that uh, the maintenance of the batteries and the, and the failure rate of the batteries wasn't that bad. So hybrid vehicle imports started coming uh, increasing, or uh, used vehicle, used imports of hybrid vehicles started increasing, then plug-in electric hybrid vehicles. And then uh, a few battery electric vehicles started coming in, Nissan Leafs, one or two. But now there's quite a number coming into the country. In fact, in Kenya, there's a, there's a ride hailing app called Nopia Ride, which has exclusive, uh, they only use uh, Nissan Leafs. Uh, so it's full back, but uh, battery electric vehicles have, have charging stations in some of the shopping malls. So they are proving that uh, the battery electric vehicles work. They don't have maintenance problems. They can be serviced locally. And uh, the other benefit is that uh, the maintenance on battery electric vehicles is absolutely zero on the drivetrain. There's no maintenance on the drivetrain as compared mm -hmm. with an internal combustion engine where you have to service it regularly and so on. So that is a big plus that uh, many are realizing. Of course, uh, the price of battery electric vehicles are high compared to the uh, internal combustion engine counterparts. But we've realized that for two and three wheelers, the cost of battery electric uh, two and three wheelers has come down to the level of internal combustion engines. Mm -hmm. That's why we're supporting the in in importation of uh, battery electric two wheelers. We have a big program going on. Uh, we have some sample units that we're going to roll out uh, to build awareness uh, of the units. So uh, definitely it'll grow. The maintenance isn't an issue and uh, only experience is going, to, is going to show that as more imports come in here. But used vehicles is the way because Africa is very uh, uh, price sensitive. So cost is a very big issue. So I don't think we'll get away from uh, used imports. But from the units that have come in, uh, they have proved to be reliable and they can be maintained. And we don't have an issue with breakdowns on uh, battery electric vehicles on the continent here. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. I think this is very, this is very insightful. Thank you. Right. Um, uh, would Claire, Claire, would you like to come in also on the same question around around e-mobility, uh, electric vehicles? Uh, what are you seeing in terms of viability? In terms of, you know, um, and any quick insight? If not, I will be. Uh, hello. I can hear you, Claire. Okay, uh, I think my take is um, currently, uh, like uh, Henry has mentioned, uh, the used vehicles are still dominating, and I feel the most, the biggest challenge right now in Africa is the infrastructure to support uh, e-mobility. Uh, I don't see the government uh, putting in any initiatives or supporting the startups. People are coming up with ideas, but they're not being supported uh, financially. So if we don't have that infrastructure, then I don't see the the e-mobility or the electric vehicles advancing so much mm. in that um, in that direction. Absolutely, that is absolutely a fundamental pre-requirement. Charlene, I'll come to you in one second because I want to continue this conversation on this with Dora. Uh, Dora, you answered a number of questions in the chat around uh, around uh, the electric vehicles, around the use of the electric vehicles on on uh, hilly or uh, you know different terrains. Uh, would you like to add something to this discussion? Okay, uh, there's somebody who asked for now, do you introduce e-mobility? Uh, probably what we did initially was we started with uh, a baseline survey to okay. actually um, come up with the perceptions of the communities whom we wanted to save uh, on transport. At that juncture, we didn't talk about immobility, but we just wanted to come up with challenges faced by the communities in terms of for transport. And then we, lo we had a, a launch where we then introduced the tricycle and 
well, on the day when we introduced the tricycle, we then built um, confidence and also built uh, the need for uh, alternate means of transport. And then as we engaged the women, we then uh, learned together with them the opportunities and also the challenges that were brought in by the tricycle. And we also assisted the manufacturer to modify according to the terrain of Singapore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, so, thank you. No, that that's important. The customization, the contextualization of any solution is absolutely fundamental. Charlene, I want to come back to you on the challenges you might face. You said you were one of the two countries, or you are one of the two countries on the continent to have such an integrated uh, strategy. Uh, what are your lessons in terms of what challenges the others who want to take that path might face? Very quickly. Uh, yeah, actually the challenges are not more on the like the on the process, but more around the process. Uh, I would I would point out the political issues because the Ministry of Transport and the Ministry of Sustainable Development, uh, which are involved in this project, are both handling projects on their own. I mean a lot of things are going on at the same time. So monitoring will be uh, for me an issue and if we're not uh, close enough, if we're not inst insisting enough on, on them to get back to them and following up, uh, it would be hard. And of course the, um, the, the issue of, of financing as well and uh, the, because digitization and electrification is one of the big uh, steps on this, uh, one of the big objectives of this roadmap. So bringing bringing both uh, uh these issues will be uh would be a challenge for for us and uh yeah we we hope that uh with the like with the collaboration of of either the the political authorities and the the finance um actors will be able to to converge uh, for for to to actually applied this uh, this roadmap and not uh, to to leave it behind like uh, many policies that have been done uh, in the past because policies exist but it's the implementation and the monitoring that is a problem so yeah we'll be following up closely on these issues. Thank you. Very important. Uh, before I close. 30 seconds, if anyone else would like to, Andriana, Amien, would you like to say something in closing? Andriana, first to you. Sure. Uh, I think uh, the question has been answered on looking at um, infrastructure along the lines of energy charging stations, for example, mm -hmm. but also the, the terrain. Um, there's one of the speakers that brought up the terrain that is very important where electric vehicles are concerned. I know of one of the major manufacturers of electric vehicles that is unable to import directly into some of the African countries because terrain is a question of whether those vehicles are actually have the ability to operate in that terrain. I think uh, the question of also policy has been put forward and discussed extensively because um, when you talk about incentives or even classification in terms of taxations or even waiving away the tax, tax uh, ta taxation is done based on engine sizes. And this becomes a challenge when it comes to registration of electric vehicles. So that must also match at infrastructure but must be matched by policy. Last but not least, capacity. Uh, the same electric manufacturers for uh, ele electric vehicle manufacturers were saying that um, the electric battery is can power village and small towns. So, do our electricians and mechanics are they able to repair and maintain vehicle whenever whenever that is needed? Are they able to change the battery or the different maintenance that is required for for, for electric vehicle? Can they even open the bonnet of the car? So we need to answer the, the, that question by ensuring capacity and training mm -hmm. for our there. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. I mean, you have literally 15 seconds before I wrap this up. Good. Uh, I, I have faith that we will seize the opportunity to drive back better. Um, because it's now or never in a way, but I can just quickly quote the statistics from um, Uyulo. I see Mr. Eaton Palmer is also online. 
and there was a question that was asked Cipra about the greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. uh, as compared to so uh, a reputable study that was undertaken by them said that in South Africa it is particular to our fuel mix and how clean or dirty it is if we were to move euro two vehicles to euro six specs which we're not we can achieve a 12 percent saving if we charge with the existing ESCOM, it's our national supplier that is coal based for the most part and quite dirty. Uh -huh. um, EVs charged by ESCOM can achieve a 34% saving um, and EVs charged by renewable energy obviously up to 67%. So I just wanted to clarify that because often people say, oh, but what if you use your dirty electricity? Yeah. Um, so that despite we still achieve a significant saving. Thank you. Thank you for flagging that. Absolutely. There is no reason to say we will not make the shift. I think it's important that we make the shift, we find the right solutions. Thank you all, the potential is huge. The innovations are there. The question is scaling up and scaling up, we've heard about the importance of policy, the importance of business models, the importance of fiscal incentives, of institutional capacities, of implementation and monitoring arrangements and very important, the, 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 the absolute significance of bringing together different actors, different stakeholders, whether it's the private sector with a big P, whether it's the private sector with a small P, whether it is the community groups, the stakeholders, national governments, local governments, regional governments, uh, innovators, startups. This is really the space for us to be engaging in if we want to leapfrog the old technologies leapfrog from unsustainable solutions to a sustainable and resilient transport and mobility future. I must say thanks. I must also say a big thank you to SLOCAT and to ITF. There are some very complimentary comments for you in the chat saying this has been a, a very well balanced panel and a panel with, uh, with so many women typically not seen in a technical <laughs> discussion. So very much appreciated uh, Slowcat and ITF for pulling us all together. And to each one of you, keep doing the great work, keep collaborating, keep reaching out, and we will win this race together. Thank you very much. Thank you.